I, I use this analogy a lot. You know, if you had a, a puppy, like a young, energetic puppy, and you never took it outside, that would be animal abuse, right? And yet, for some reason, we apply that same behavior uh, to ourselves. We never take ourselves outside. We never expose ourselves to nature. And yet, we're somehow okay with it. And we look around at population health, and people are not well. Hey everybody, Dr. Josh Axe here, and today we've got an awesome guest, Max Lugavir, and he's got a new book out called The Genius Life. We're gonna talk about how to heal your mind, strengthen your body, become extraordinary, and uh, all kinds of great stuff. Circadian rhythms, we're gonna talk adaptogens, probably a little Chinese medicine, de-stressing, but just generally how to heal your body and get well. So Max, uh, welcome to the show. Thanks, Dr. Axe, for having me, it's a pleasure. Yeah, so I know you, you and I got to talk recently too because I was uh, I was on your podcast and was excited to have you on mine. And um, you know, we're going to get to talk all kinds of great stuff here. You were the first person in an interview to ask me about he shu wu, uh, one of the ancient <laughs> adaptogens, and you pronounced it correctly, which was amazing too. So, anyways, uh, man, I'm stoked to have you. And man, let's let's go ahead and dive right in. You know, one of the things I wanted to uh, ask you about is sort of circadian biology. I know that, you know, you've, I, I know you've, in your book, you talk a lot about nutrition, so we're going to dive into that. But talk to me about these, our sort of circadian biology, circadian rhythms, why these are important, how we can reset them, and what your recommendations are. Yeah, absolutely. So this is a topic that's become very important to me as somebody who travels all the time and finds myself, you know, working. I'm part of the, you know, I'm a knowledge worker. I think that's the term. You know, I, I work on my smartphone, on my computer, I'm at my desk all the time, whether it's writing or doing a, you know, recording a podcast. So I'm like, I'm sure many of your listeners who spends the vast majority of their time indoors and out of, you know, the ambient light of the sun. And, you know, this is problematic, just one of the many ways in which the modern world has become problematic for our internal systems, because many of our genes are regulated by time. And unfortunately, the body doesn't have a clock that we can, um, you know, set with buttons, we have to set it through uh, what are essentially time setters and light is the primary time setter that our brains use to, to recognize what time of day it is. And once we set the clock in our brains, well, you know, the rest of the body sort of functions on a timer. It's a 24 hour timer. We're diurnal creatures, uh, which implies that, you know, we are meant to be most active to um, set up camp, forage, procure food, uh, and enjoy social opportunities for the most part during the day when it's light out. And so the fact that 97% of our time today is spent indoors in our homes or driving around in our cars means that we're not getting the adequate uh, exposure to bright blue light from the sun that we need in order to set our clocks. And this can affect everything from focus and clarity to digestion and even our risk for disease, new research is beginning to show. So the recommendation that I make for people, uh, generally, you want to be really sort of cognizant of the the intensity of light that you are getting in through your eyeballs in the morning. Um, you know, a thousand lux, generally lux is a unit with which we measure uh, light intensity and people can download an app actually on their smartphones called lux, which can give them a sense, a relative sense of the light exposure in their domiciles and outside, and generally a thousand lux is very easy to obtain, even on an overcast day. On an overcast day, you get anywhere between a thousand to 10,000 lux of light just by standing outside or by standing by your open uh, window. And you need about a half an hour of that to really set off this, this circadian rhythm, which does a number of things for you. So bright light they've shown can actually boost levels of serotonin in the brain. So a lot of people, come the winter months, they start to develop uh, feelings of, of doom and gloom, essentially. And that's actually a, a, a psychiatric condition that is now being called seasonal affective disorder. And one of, I think, the causative players in that is that we don't allow ourselves access to as much bright light um, in the winter months. I mean, part of that has to do with the fact that the sun just isn't around as long. But getting bright blue light in through your eyes in the morning can help bring, you know, can help normalize levels of serotonin in the brain, which is obviously a neurotransmitter that people might be familiar with. It's involved with um, mood, but it's also involved in executive function. So as aspects of, you know, our cognitive uh, abilities that, in, in, that allow us to get things done, light has a profound effect on that. 
Um, so I think that that's a crucial, uh, you know, a, a, cr a crucial lifestyle hack that I think is not only going to help people feel better, um, but perform better and, and also, um, help them avert, uh, you know, the potential of, um, diseases, uh, that nobody wants. So just to give you a, a sense of what I mean by that, I know that's a, a big claim. Many people, when they wake up in the mornings, uh, especially when they wake up due to an alarm clock, that hasn't always given their brains the chance to really taper down the production of melatonin, which is our body's primary sleep hormone. So a lot of people that are underslept, they experience you know, artificially shortened sleep. They wake up when melatonin levels you know, might not have fully subsided. And melatonin is an incredible hormone. It's an antioxidant hormone. It's involved in uh, gene expression. But one of the um, negative consequences of ha having melatonin elevated in the morning when it shouldn't be is that melatonin can actually negatively affect something called insulin sensitivity, which is how your body responds to the hormone insulin. And that's problematic because what that means is if you consume carbohydrates in that context, when, when you know, like your average uh, American, you know, the, the, your average continental breakfast here in the States is a a muffin or a bowl of cereal or a pop tart and a glass of juice. That means that in that context, when your melatonin levels in the morning haven't properly subsided, that can lead to elevated levels of blood sugar that um, would be elevated for longer than when they, you know, for the duration in which they normally would be elevated for. So getting that bright light in in the morning again, it's a great way to turn off melato mel melatonin production and really set your body up for the day. Um, at the end of the day, light is equally important, but the impetus is on us to really make sure that we're being very deliberate about the light that we let to allow to enter our eyes. And we wanna be really cautious about that and to actually not let as much light enter our eyes. So as easy as it is to set our internal time setters um, in the first half of the day, it's just as easy today in the modern world to disrupt that rhythm by getting too much light in through our eyes. The preponderance of smartphones and huge TV screens and even overhead lighting in you know, our gyms and supermarkets can easily reach the light intensity, that 1000 lux, that our brains sense as being a signal that it's daytime. So if you're doing that later on in the evening, that is negatively gonna affect your sleep and as I mentioned, um, light shuts off melatonin production. So you're actually suppressing the release of melatonin uh, later in the day by allowing bright light into your eyes later in the day. And that's problematic too because melatonin, as I mentioned, is an antioxidant. It's involved in cancer protection. It regulates a process called autophagy, which is when your cells clean house. So yeah, light is... Um, it's actually, it's a drug in a sense. I mean, it's a drug in terms of how powerful it is as a, as a health boosting, um, you know, in terms of its health boosting potential, but then it also can have negative side effects uh, like most drugs do, if not all drugs do, later on in the day. So I do a deep dive in what we currently know about circadian biology in, in my book, The Genius Life, and it's a super exciting, rapidly evolving field of science, but uh, it just goes to show you that health and well-being goes beyond just what we put into our mouths, right? It's, it's about the full picture. And that's kind of what, what, you know, living the genius life acknowledges. I love it. You know, again, this is such an important concept. And there are things that I, I know both you and I do talk a lot about diet and the importance of diet. But I do think it's so important to remember there are so many other things that impact our health. I know you and I, you know, on my podcast talked a little bit about, or when I was on yours, talked about emotional health, but there are these things, you're talking about sunlight, you know, we could talk about uh, things like earthing and grounding, we could talk about relationships. So that's another thing. Uh, what are some of the other things that maybe you discuss in your book or you've researched over the years? You talked about light and circadian rhythms. What are some of the other things and factors um, you know, hot and cold temperature, all this kind of stuff. Because I know one of the things I think I read something where you mentioned about um, even Alzheimer's disease. I mean, some of the things that are important there. So I'd love to hear you talk about some of these other things that are outside of food that, that also have, have, have this big impact, sort of, I guess, these, these ways that we've sort of disconnected ourselves from the natural world. Yeah, I mean, that's a really good way to put it. We've become completely disconnected from the natural world. And, you know, we are, I, I use this analogy a lot. You know, if you had a, a puppy, like a young, energetic puppy, and you never took it outside, that would be animal abuse, right? And yet, for some reason, we 
apply that same behavior uh, to ourselves. You know, we, we, we never take ourselves outside. We never expose ourselves to nature. We never allow ourselves to get that beautiful, bright blue light from the sun. And yet we're somehow okay with it. And we look around at population health and people are not well. And we wonder why. And the truth is that, like you said, I think that it's, you know, part of it has to do with the fact that we've become, uh, we've segregated ourselves from nature and we are not different from nature. We are nature. We're part of this fabric, this ecosystem. And so you alluded to te temperature, which is a major uh, aspect of, um, I think, good health and another sort of uh, connection to nature that we've lost, you know. Um, Back, you know, during the time in which our, our ancestors, uh, you know, struggled to make it in the world before we had climate control and, you know, central AC and heat, um, our ancestors experienced a wide range of temperature variation. And our bodies have been sort of honed by that because at either end of the thermal spectrum, whether it's extreme heat or extreme cold, our bodies know that, you know, extreme variation can actually kill you if you're not careful. And so we have hardwired protective and restorative uh, machinery actually hard coded into our genome that flip on when we expose ourselves to even slight variations in temperature. And yet today, too many of us stay within our comfort zones. And I think when it comes to anything good in life, whether it's creativity or good health, staying within your comfort bubble, I think is not a good thing. So I talk about research that is now being performed all around the world in major academic institutions where they're finding that just by exposing yourself to, to um, differences in temperature that you can see a profound improvement in terms of, your, uh, in terms of various markers of your health. So at the, at the you know, upper end of the thermal spectrum, we can talk about heat. So I cite research now coming out of the University of Eastern Finland, which is showing us that regular sauna use is associated with dramatically improved health and uh, more specifically risk reductions for some of humanity's most feared conditions. So heart disease, um, dementia, and more specifically Alzheimer's disease. And I think part of the reason for this, well, I think there are a few mechanisms that are worth exploring. So first, when we sit in a sauna, um, and I'll give you guys, because I know that not everybody has access to a sauna, unlike in Finland, um, you know, Finland is the sauna capital of the world. There's on average one sauna for every household in Finland. Wow. Yeah. It's pretty crazy. That's where it's like the, the home of, of saunas. It's like the global capital. Um, and, and just to, b before I get into the mechanisms, I think it's really cool, Dr. Axe, because, you know, it's a, it's a good, le it's a good opportunity to sort of learn about, um, observational research. So, in the US, if you were to do a study and look at saunas and health outcomes, for example, you might say there, there would be a very strong healthy user bias because in the US, you know, people who have access to saunas probably either have houses that are big enough to accommodate a sauna or they have gym memberships where, you know, they have access to saunas or they go to spas regularly, right? So there's a strong healthy user bias. Th those people are probably doing a lot of things in their lifestyles and in their diets that are good for them. But in Finland, as I mentioned, saunas are so common, people take saunas like they take showers. And so it's a really good population with which to study like how frequently are these people using saunas and what is their health you know, looking like. And so what they find is that saunas actually act, when you expose yourself to extremes of heat, it actually acts like an exercise mimetic in the body. It mimics some of the beneficial effects of exercise. And people can kind of think about when they've ever, you know, if they've ever sprained an ankle or bruised something, you put a hot compress, you know, on the, on your joint or whatever, and it draws sort of blood to the surface. It makes it really hot and it, uh, it, it promotes healing. Well, the same thing happens on a full body level when you sit in a sauna, it creates nitric oxide. So it increases blood flow and it gets your heart rate going. If you put your you know, your fingers on your, on the radial artery in your wrist to feel your pulse, you'll notice that your pulse actually, um, elevates to a point almost as if you were on a treadmill doing, um, mild to moderate levels of cardio. So you're getting a workout just sitting in the sauna because your body is trying to contend with this heat, which it knows that if you were to sit in there for, you know, for an extremely long time, a, a, you know, a duration that I wouldn't recommend, it could actually be very unhealthy, but just the right dose of, uh, you know, of sitting in that sauna actually gives your body a powerful workout. It also makes you sweat. And that's, I think, the most obvious um, 
effect that occurs when you're in a sauna. And I think that's important because sweating is one of the body's primary means of detoxification, of releasing certain heavy metals and environmental toxins like BPA and phthalates, which I actually talk a lot about in my book as well, which can act like endocrine disruptors. They can affect your, you know, the system of hormones in your body. And then finally, um, so those are all why, where saunas, I think, really can benefit the cardiovascular system, help reduce risk for heart disease and things like that. But then where the brain is concerned, it's been found that um, saunas, because they apply heat you know, onto the entirety of the body, they activate proteins in the body that are called heat shock proteins. And what heat shock proteins do is they're sort of like, they act like scaffolding to other proteins in the body when they're activated. And they were actually named because they were first identified um, because they, you know, they, they are primarily, or they were expressed when they were first observed uh, in response to heat. But we now know that heat shock proteins are expressed during a myriad of different um, environmental stressors. But this is crucial because these proteins, they act like scaffolding. They help pr protect other proteins in the, in the body from a process called misfolding. And when a protein gets misfolded, it basically becomes like a junk protein, and that can be problematic. It you know, might not serve its intended purpose. It might actually be recognized by the body as being a foreign invader. And it might be more inclined, a misfolded protein, to aggregate and form plaques. Now, in the brain, the last thing that you want to do is fill your brain up with plaque. And in fact, Alzheimer's disease and another neurodegenerative condition called Parkinson's disease are defined in part by a overabundance of these plaques in the brain that are made of a protein called amyloid beta. And the thinking is, is that by exposing yourself to heat and thereby causing a, an upregulation an up of, the, um, of these heat shock proteins, you're actually helping protect proteins like amyloid beta from misfolding and then you know, aggregating to form these plaques. And so actually what they found is that, and this is where the rubber hits the road in terms of epidemiology and observational studies, that there seems to be a dose response with sauna use, that the more people sit in a sauna, the less their risk seems to be for Alzheimer's disease and other forms of dementia. Wow. Yeah, it's pretty remarkable. Um, and so, you know, I talk about food and exercise and all these things, but what about something that you can do, you know, just sitting there in a sauna relaxing um, as, a, as a means of reducing your risk for Alzheimer's disease? The risk reduction for using a sauna three to five times per week is about 65%. So that's a 65% risk reduction for developing Alzheimer's disease. And there's no drug on the market that you can take. There's no pill that's going to slash your risk of developing Alzheimer's disease by 65%. So I think the science needs to continue to evolve, but I'm very optimistic about the, um, the idea of using saunas um, as a means of mitigating my risk for Alzheimer's disease, especially knowing that there is no meaningful treatment available to us for that condition. Well, well, Max, one of the things I know that you and I have in common is that part of what brought us into these industries, this natural health industry, is uh, trying to get family members well. For myself, it was my mom who was diagnosed with cancer, who overcame mm -hmm. her condition using food as medicine. I know for you, you really worked and created a treatment plan for your mom. Can you just talk to us a little bit? I, I think you know your mom was diagnosed with dementia. You know, to, to tell me about that and what were some things that you did for your mom specifically? Yeah, Dr. X. Well, it's actually kind of a tragic story, but my mom uh, at the age of 58 was diagnosed with a neurodegenerative condition, a form of dementia, not Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's disease is the most common form of dementia that people might be familiar with. But my mom actually had something called Lewy body dementia, which is sort of, mm. it's almost worse. Yeah. It feels like having Parkinson's disease and Alzheimer's disease at the same time. And I was completely caught off guard by that diagnosis. My family, I had no prior history of any kind of neurodegenerative condition. And certainly what I had thought about Alzheimer's disease and other you know, related conditions at the time was that they were old people's issues, you know, like somewhere down the road, you know, it's something that you worry about later on, age-related senility, you know, who doesn't have it when you're in your 80s, 90s, whatever. I mean, my, my thinking was very callous, but those were misconceptions that I think many people harbored. Yeah. And I did too. And uh, looking back in, in retrospect, I hate that I harbored those misconceptions. But one of the things that, that they motivated me to do very early on in that process was to understand everything that I possibly could about dementia and Alzheimer's disease and the etiology of those conditions, why they develop, um, 
to the best of my ability, um, knowing that I wasn't going to understand everything, but that I was a, my background was as a journalist. And so I knew how to ask questions. And I also had access to uh, researchers all around the world because of my media credentials. So I rolled up my sleeves and I started to look into the primary literature and, and to try to figure out what were the risk factors that, you know, that my mom might have had that would have predisposed her to have developing this condition. And what are the interventions? What are the clinical trials going on around the, around the world that I might be able to look at to glean some sort of paradigm as to how you know, I could help improve my mom's condition, but also um, prevent myself, prevent, it from, pre prevent that from ever happening to me. Yeah. And so it became this fixation on understanding, you know, what was going on in my mom's brain. And, you know, I've got to tell you that, uh, you know, I tried to put her on the rigorous max diet even before I had written my last book, but dietary change is one of the hardest things for people to do. It's, yep. it's very difficult. You've got to be highly motivated. And if you throw dementia into that mix, it becomes even more difficult. So, mm -hmm. um, and I wouldn't want my mom to, to sacrifice her quality of life, which, uh, you know, was becoming less and less. It was, it was getting more and more compromised um, as time would go on. And the last thing that I would want to do, and I think people with um, loved ones that are ill can probably relate to this. The last thing that I would want her to do is to, would be to feel shame about her food choices around me, you know? So as militant as I would want to be with my own diet, if I had dementia, for example, um, I didn't want to be that way around her. The last thing I would want to do is compromise my relationship with her. And she just, you know, I think that she would listen to me about certain things, but, uh, I know that your mom did a complete overhaul. I wish that, you know, I could say that my mom what? did. Yeah. Yeah, what I was going to say, I mean, as much as my mom did, <laughs> I've had other family members and other people I've cared for there who haven't, you know, at all. So it just, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I'm going off of the best available evidence, but, you know, I can't say with any certainty that, you know, switching my mom's diet would have reversed her condition either because we just don't have that kind of evidence. So uh, that lasted for about seven years. And then things took a, a, an even more tragic turn for the worse. Um, and that was sort of one of the motivations for me to write my latest book. Um, in, during Labor Day of 2018, uh, I mean, if you thought having dementia was bad, my mom was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. Mm. And it was already in stage four by the time at which it was diagnosed. And it was just a gutting experience for uh, my family. And it was, you know, they, they gave her a prognosis of three months um, to live at that point. And it was just horrendous. It was horrible. And I was actually met with the same sort of bleakness and hopelessness when my mom was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer that I was when my mom was diagnosed with a neurodegenerative condition. So that inspired me to sort of look, you know, to broaden out and look at other areas of the environment that could be making us sick, not just predisposing us to conditions related to the brain, but could just could be responsible for our overall malaise. And the fact that you know, certain cancers now seem to be exploding and autoimmunity seems to be on the rise. It's just, there's a, you know, I think there's a mismatch between the environments that many of us have inherited and our biology. And, you know, those are some of the ideas that I explore in Genius Foods because what my mom developed were two of the most feared conditions in, you know, amongst humanity for the most part. I mean, you know, pancreatic cancer doesn't care who you are. It doesn't care if you have money. Uh, you know, I mean, look at Steve Jobs. You yeah. Know, he, he, didn't, he didn't last very long after his diagnosis. So it's tragic and horrible. And, you know, my only hope is to use the spirit of, you know, of the, and the, the, my mom's life and how she inspired me to help inspire other people to live more healthily so that they might not have to go through what it was that my mom went through. Well, Max, thanks for sharing the story or transparency. I, I didn't know the story. I just knew that, you know, you referenced because I had read through some of your book and, and uh, saw in the byline that you referenced your mom. But again, I appreciate your, you know, your, your authenticity, sharing her story. And again, sometimes stories end in, um, uh, you know, end, end in, uh, you know, health and sometimes they don't. But again, one of the things that I'm inspired by just hearing you is that I, I love your mission. I love now that you're, you're out there to help prevent these issues. Like I think back with my mom, again, part of my motivation was my mom was so sick when I was a kid. She had chronic fatigue syndrome, was in bed half of her life, like exhausted, overwhelmed. And I said, like, 
to a degree, like, I don't want to see my mom have to suffer. My mom have to be like, go through this. But again, looking at what you're doing now, writing your book, doing your podcast, everything else, again, it's just inspiring to me that again, I, and this is, this is something for me when I interview people, um, that again, um, that I think is so powerful is that when you're able to, when you're on a mission, when you're on a mission to help your family member, when you're on a mission to then help people, especially prevent some of these issues, there's something about it. Cause like when my mom had her condition, I read more than I've ever read. You know what I'm saying? Like I studied more, I searched more, I talked to more uh, experts in the industry and I learned more and I, you know, used, used the bad for good, you know? And so anyways, I just appreciate that you're uh, on a mission doing that. And, um, and so anyways, yeah, again, thanks for, uh, you know, thanks so much for sharing that. You know, I know in your, <laughs> I know in your book as well, the genius, which by the way, I do just want to give a shout out here. You've mentioned it a couple times, but your book, it was a New York times bestseller. It's called genius foods. And, uh, I know you've got, uh, endorsements in it from some of our mutual friends and colleagues. You got Dr. David Perlmutter. Uh, you've got, um, Will, Dr. William Davis, Dr. Uh, Dr. Uh, Mehmet Oz, who I, I had on the show here just uh, not too long ago. And, um, and anyway, so I want to encourage everybody to check out the book, uh, Genius Foods. It's on Amazon.com and in bookstores nationwide. All right, let's dive in here. I'd love to talk a little bit about toxicity because as we're looking at the numerous health problems, some of which you mentioned, dementia, especially things like cancer, there's an absolute link to toxicity in the body and certain types of cancer. So what, t talk to me about the toxic industrial chemicals and what, what those are doing, especially to our hormones, our metabolism, our brain function. What's, what are some things that people can start doing right now? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, you know, we're inundated with industrial chemicals every chance we turn. And I'm not chemophobic, meaning I'm not, you know, afraid of chemicals that I can't necessarily pronounce. Like I don't want people to live in a state of fear of, you know, any sort of compound on the ingredients list that has more than one or two syllables. That's not my goal, but my goal is to sort of let people know that um, there are many times throughout history where products, chemicals have been unleashed into the environment um, without appropriate testing, only later to be realized having caused major health and environmental problems. So people can think about lead-based paints, which have been used up until 1978, right? We used to paint our homes with paints uh, made primarily with, with using lead as a primary ingredient because it sped the drying time of those paints. And those paints, it's a very good example to use because they were thought to be inert, right? But little did we know at the time that in high friction parts of the house, window sills, uh, you know, stairwell banisters, things like that, paint can actually form dust and chip off and enter our lungs. It can get on the hands of uh, adults and children. And, you know, we, a lot of us, um, you know, have, we, you know, have hand to mouth behavior a lot more than we'd like to acknowledge sometimes. But, um, you know, th these paints can actually enter, can easily enter circulation. Um, another good example is asbestos-based building ins ins insulation. So, you know, the insulation in our homes used to be provided by uh, a compound called asbestos, which we now know is a major poison and is responsible for different types of uh, cancer, primarily lung cancer, uh, mesothelioma, uh, mesothelioma, a certain type of lung cancer. Um, various pesticides like DDT, which has been outlawed. So the, the point is that there's been numerous times where industry has unleashed, you know, a compound um, into the world. And uh, we've sort of accepted those compounds as being innocent until proven guilty. But my argument that I make in my book, The Genius Life, which is my new book, is that these compounds should be considered guilty until proven innocent. Um, and we can see countless examples of, of chemicals, even now, that, um, you know, we have in our supermarkets that you know, are in our homes, in our kitchens, in our drug cabinets uh, that are having profound consequences on our health. So I talk a bit about um, plastic related compounds like phthalates and BPA. You know, there was just a study that published, that was published this week that came out um, and it, you know, it came out and it, I'm, I'm sad that I was able, not able to incorporate it into my new book because it's, uh, it's so apropos, but 
testing standards for BPA haven't been changed in over 20 years. And so the amount of BPA in our systems, they're now finding actually is about 44% higher, or no, I'm sorry, 44 fold higher. So that's 44 times higher than what was previously thought. BPA is a plastic related compound that's used to create hard plastics. So um, it's used in water bottles, our furniture is made of it. Um, it's used to line the interiors of cans. Um, and uh, it's also used to coat store register receipts. So thermal sensitive store uh, reg register receipts, the kinds that you can write on with your fingernail, those are all coated with BPA. And BPA has been known for almost a century now to be what's called a xeno estrogen, meaning that BPA actually acts like the hormone estrogen in your body. Now, certain cancers, as you mentioned, not all, but certain are hormonally sensitive, and breast cancer is one of those. And so I think that's one of the reasons why you see this dramatic increase in incidence of breast cancer today. In fact, in the 1960s, a woman's lifetime risk of developing uh, or of being diagnosed with breast cancer was about one in 20. Today, it's one in eight. Now, certainly we've got better at diagnosing breast cancer um, over time, but I think uh, we, you know there is no certainty in terms of why that number has increased so dramatically. And I think the fact that we're just inundated now with these estrogenic compounds, um, that's one major uh, source of despair for our, our, you know, our endocrine system. Um, another uh, plastic related compound or class of compounds are called phthalates. And phthalates are in, phthalates are usually made to make, um, if you have a, a plastic um, material that's soft, Phthalates generally to make plastic, it's a, it's a softening compound and BPA is sort of a hardening compound for plastics. Um, but phthalates are being used in everything from, um, from plastic related compounds, uh, water coats, things like that. You know, our cars are loaded with phthalates to fragrances. So you'll find anywhere you see um, fragrances listed on a, um, on, a, on a product, whether it's a, a home cleaning product or um, an air freshener or the like, usually those fragrances are made using phthalates. And phthalates are also xenoestrogens. And these, these compounds accumulate in our bodies. And they act to disrupt our system of hormones. So, I mean, estrogen is the sort of the, the, the primary hormone that they screw with. But um, we don't yet fully appreciate, I don't think, the myriad of ways in which these compounds affect us. So, you know, your system of hormones governs everything from your predisposition to disease, to fat storage, to brain function, to even uh, sexual function, libido, and development. And depending on where you are on the age spectrum, these compounds can have a more pronounced or a less pronounced uh, effect on you. So for example, if you were to mess with your hormones as an adult, um, you might see a, uh, an increase in your lifetime risk of developing, again, you know, certain cancers. Um, you might see maybe a little more fat storage, uh, for example, maybe you're, it can mess with your hunger levels. I mean, these are all things that are by and large uh, reversible. But if you were, say, you know, in adolescence or even earlier than that you know, on your, in, in your life, tinkering with hormones can actually have a lifelong effect because hormones guide development. Uh, thyroid hormones, for example, affect the you know, brain development. Um, sex hormones affect, like estrogen affect, you know, everything from your, um, you know, the development of your sexual features to, you know, any number of factors. So I think it's important to become aware of where these compounds are in the environment. And generally, what I recommend for people is to be hyper vigilant in terms of lessening your uh, reliance on plastic. So you should never, or to the best of your ability, eat or drink out of plastic. And especially if the food that you're eating or the beverage that you're drinking is hot, because heat accelerates the leaching of these compounds into um, what it is that you're consuming. So that's crucially important. And as I mentioned earlier, um, you know, saunas and sweating, sweat is a major vehicle by which we can excrete some of these compounds. They do a number of studies um, every couple of years. They're called blood, sweat, urine studies, where they look at blood, sweat, urine, and they look at what, you know, people have um, in those fluids. And, you know, you can actually excrete a significant amount of these compounds uh, through those routes. So I think it's just important to stay hydrated, you know, to drink clean water. The solution to pollution is dilution, as they say. So, you know, make sure that you're staying hydrated, that you're sweating frequently, that you're exercising vigorously. And then aside from reducing our reliance on these, 
on these products that use plastics. Um, it's also important to eat in a way, like to use, uh, to consume a diet that can help reduce the burden of toxicity in your body. And I know that, you know, you talk all the time about diet and my previous book, Genius Foods, I covered sort of some of my dietary uh, philosophy and I do so as well in the new book. But um, but eating a nutrient-dense diet, incorporating foods like cruciferous vegetables, which are powerfully detoxifying, um, dark leafy greens and the like. Uh, I'm a big advocate of eating properly raised um, animal sourced products. So grass-fed beef, um, I think is important for detox because it provides it's the, one of the top sources of sulfur containing amino acids and sulfur is the backbone of glutathione, which is your body's primary, um, detoxifier. It's your body's master antioxidant and detoxifier. So, um, grass fed beef, dark leafy greens, cruciferous vegetables, eggs, things like that, all crucial. And, you know, it's not about completely eliminating your exposure because it's just going to be, that's going to drive you crazy in the modern world. It's just about kind of becoming cognizant of where these chemicals lie and then doing the best that you can to avoid them. Yeah, that's good. That's really good. Um, one of the things we've talked a little bit about sweating, you brought up the sauna a few times, which I love. In fact, I have a Chelsea and I have a sauna here in Nashville that we use really frequently, especially in the winter. We use it uh, a lot of times more often, but, um, I want to talk to you about one of the things I saw you uh, quote this somewhere and you said, um, you've got a trick to supercharge your brain that kind of tricks your brain into getting the equivalent of a marathon workout in 10 minutes. So I'd love to hear, <laughs> hear what that is. I know what a, what a prospect, right? <laughs> yeah. So in the book, I talk a lot about what we currently know about best practices for exercise and building the body that you've always desired, both in terms of body composition, but also strength. We know that strength is re directly related to better brain health. Um, they've done a number of studies now where they're finding that more robust uh, muscles actually is really good for the brain. And I think that there's a number of reasons, a, no, a number of mechanisms that could potentially explain that. But one exercise modality that I talk a bit about um, and that I think is really important for everybody to do is high intensity interval training. Mm. Um, so high intensity interval training, basically, it's going, it's it's doing a sprint. It's like giving it, giving whatever modality you choose your all for 10 to 20 to maybe 30 seconds. Don't worry about speed or pace or distance or anything like that. It's really just about the effort that you give it and going all out for 10 to 20 to 30 seconds and then rinsing and repeating, doing that about five, six times. They've done studies, one study in particular that I cite in the book where they find that a number of cycles of this uh, with about a two minute warm up and cool down on each side. So totaling 10 minutes actually can improve your VO2 max, which is a measure of how efficiently your body utilizes oxygen to create energy. The equivalent of the control group that was um, told to basically do steady state cardio on a treadmill for 45 minutes. So they found the same improvement in VO2 max with this 10 minute high intensity interval training um, workout as people who were just, you know, plodding along on the treadmill, which I know nobody likes to do. I mean, maybe some people like to do it. I personally can't stand, uh, yep. you know, extended bouts on the treadmill. So it made me really happy to find this study because it basically means that whether it's doing sprints up a hill or what I like to do in my gym, we have what are called battle ropes. You just swing these ropes around. They're like these heavy sort of like yeah. shipping, shipping ropes or uh, using a stationary bike and going all out for 10 to 20 seconds and then stopping and then you know cycling or swinging the ropes at a more moderate pace for a minute to cool down and then doing it again, giving it your all for 10 to 20 to 30 seconds. Um, and then doing that maybe five, six times with again a minute of a minute or two of warm-up at the you know at the beginning and then a little bit of a cool down at the end. All it takes, it seems, is 10 minutes to get the same improvement in your VO2 max, which is a very important measure of fitness, by the way, um, as people that are on the treadmill for 45 minutes. So that was uh, one of the, I think, that was a good day for me when I discovered that study because um, I've never really enjoyed doing cardio. And uh, even though I do think that cardio has its place, um, especially if you're training for uh, you know, an endurance comp competition or something like that, um, but yeah, I'm a big fan of, of high intensity interval training. And I think one of the mechanisms by which it works is it creates a momentary energy crisis um, for your cells. 
So it has kind of something to do with fasting and the fact that calorie restriction has been shown to be one of the few things that can extend the life of smaller organisms. Calorie restriction basically causes an energy crisis, a full body energy crisis where your body, your body's like, Hey, we're not getting enough energy. We better batten down the hatches before, um, you know, so that we can survive until the next, whatever it is, season where food is going to be available or the next successful hunt. So when you do high intensity interval training, it kind of sends the same message to your cells because you're working, you're putting in so much work that your cells can't basically get enough energy from the available oxygen um, or sugar uh, that is at their disposal. And so at the cellular level, it causes a number of really important adaptations that in the grand scheme of things, make you a more robust organism. And it seems to improve vigor and yeah, high intensity interval training, I think is just, is crucial. Um, I also talk about resistance training and the value of getting to the gym and lifting weights, which I think is very important. Um, you know, I might have a bias for, for weightlifting. It's something that I've always been into. Uh, but I do think that the, that it's, it's very promising. Science seems to be coming out, you know, Every year there are new studies showing just how important it is to have strong muscles and to, and to be mobile and flexible and to, um, you know, I just think it's a, it's a really great um, thing for guys and girls and, you know, across the age spectrum, it becomes crucially important, I think, to, to, to lift weights. And then I talk about aerobic exercise, although, you know, I don't think that you necessarily need to do it. You can, um, or I don't think that you need to do the cardio in the in the typical sense i think that you can you know have do high intensity interval training or kind of craft a, a resistance training routine that that has a sort of cardio component yeah. to it by just shortening you know rest and then lastly the other exercise modality that i think is really important is actually not exercise at all it's um, non-exercise physical activity which burns a tremendous amount of calories throughout the day and what that is is essentially just you know, anything that you do other than sitting on the couch watching TV. Mm -hmm. So walking around, you know, dancing, doing chores around the house, all crucially important. Um, you know, when we move, whether it's walking or, um, you know, typing to some degree or, uh, you know, doing the dishes, chasing our cat, chasing our kids around the house, um, you're creating micro alterations to your blood pressure, which actually pushes fresh blood up into your brain. And conversely, sitting for an extended period of time actually drains blood from your brain. Mm. So movement is crucial. And it's also a really great way to um, torch uh, a pretty significant number of calories. It gets sort of, it's, uh, yeah, I think it's underappreciated as a means of, of you know, of burning calories, but you burn far more calories just moving throughout the day than you ever would jogging on a treadmill. So yeah, that's called, and that's called NEAT, non-exercise activity thermogenesis, which is crucially important. I love it. Well, I agree with you too. Again, and you and I have re read a lot of the same research on interval training, whether it's hit or burst or surge or all kinds of different names for it. But it really is amazing in terms of uh, the amount of fat you can burn, the amount of VO2 max you can boost in 10 minutes. We're not talking about, you know, we're not talking about an hour. We're talking about 10 minutes. So I, I'm with you. I mean, that combined with weight training, that's what my wife and I do. We do intervals and weights, you know, and sometimes we'll throw in uh, a little bit of Pilates or yoga, that type of thing in there too. But it's, it's, uh, it's the way to do it. I love that. I want to encourage you guys, check out Max's book, the genius life. Uh, it's, it's got, it looks great too, by the way, the book cover. I love that you've got sort of the shape of a brain made of some of those superfoods. It's fantastic. It's endorsed by, you know, everybody, uh, from Dr. Perlmutter to Dr. Oz. And so it's great. You can check it out. Genius foods. And I want to say Max, man, Hey, thanks for coming on. Again, I thought I, I love, uh, I love talking to you too, because you're bringing so many new things to the table. We're talking about we talked about body temperature. We talked about circadian rhythms. These are things that uh, I don't think we hear a lot about, but I think are so critical to uh, you know to us do, to to us being our best. So I want to say thanks so much for coming on. Oh yeah, my pleasure. The so the new book, The Genius Life. Yeah, it's about the simple little things that you can do in your daily life. You know, little hacks that you could sort of integrate into your daily routine that are going to have big health wins, both in terms of how you feel today and down the road. So. Thank you, Dr. Axe, for having me on. And I loved our chat on my podcast. So it's just a pleasure to connect with you. And I'm honored to have had this chat with you. Awesome. 
Hey, thanks so much for being a guest, Max. Thanks everybody for listening. This podcast is for information purposes only. Statements and views expressed in this podcast are not medical advice and have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. Opinions of guests are their own, and this podcast does not endorse or accept responsibility for statements made by guests. In some cases, individuals on this podcast may have a direct or indirect financial interest in products or services referred to herein.